Hello everybody, this is Dr. Lilian Cospedes Gonzalez and I'm back with another lecture that we're putting up here on YouTube on behalf of Travolution Tours. By the way, and in case that you're new to the platform, everything that we put out here in terms of educational content from Travolution Tours, it's all sponsored and thanks to the generosity and kindness of our lovely, lovely donors and supporters on Buy Me A Coffee and PayPal. You can actually check the links in that at the bottom of this uh, recording. And if you want to keep us going and help us carry on developing our educational agenda, well, we will love you forever and we are incredibly thankful. But for now, today, we're going to be discussing the topic of Norman art and architecture in southern Italy and Sicily. This is now the open uh, public lecture that I'm leaving here for everybody to enjoy. We've been dealing with this talk for now way over a year and a half. So we thought it was about time to making it publicly accessible to everybody. So what you can expect to find out in this lecture today is essentially the main characteristics of Norman art and architecture in uh, southern Italy and Sicily. Um, it's an area that is still not terribly developed from an academic perspective. It's something we don't talk a lot about with the general public. And if you're planning on visiting this area of the world or if you just generally like architecture and art, it's uh, quite special and you're going to find out why in just a few moments. So let's dive in. So the first thing that we're going to be doing and what I'm ranting about today is the general context. Why is this melting pot of the southern part of Italy so important and why it gives us this very rich scenario? And then we're going to break it down. We're going to be looking at architecture first. And in the context of architecture, we're going to be looking specifically at castles and churches. Then we're going to be looking at art in many different shapes and forms from mosaics, frescoes, to uh, decorations in doorways, etc., etc., And then finally, a legacy uh, review. It's not necessarily a conclusion, it's more some thoughts to open up this field for you and to sort of keep you thinking about why this is so special and why we should be looking more into it. So without any further ado, let's get started with the context itself. So Italy is actually a very interesting part of the world during the 11th and 12th century. I appreciate it's also interesting during many other periods of time, but specifically in the moment that concerns us here. Now, during this moment in time in Italy, there is going to be a total of four different cultures living all under one roof. We're going to have the Lombards uh, in the central part of the Italian states. We're going to have the Greek population, mostly around in Calabria. Then we're going to have the Muslim population, primarily in the area of Sicily, and then the Normans that arrive in here. By the way, and just for the sake of clarity, when I say Greek population, normally in the context of the Middle Ages and, and the time period we're dealing with, as well as the geographical area, what we really mean as historians is the Greek legacy, which is embodied now by the Byzantine Empire, by the Eastern Roman Empire and its remnants. So that's what we normally mean when we refer that. At this moment in time, the area of Greece is actually going to be dominated by the Byzantines. So in case you are not entirely sure, it's not specifically just Greek, it's in general that context of Byzantine. Anyway, and moving on. At this moment in time, there is a lot of crisis in Italy due to the very fragmented geographical and political area that you see here. If you're looking at the bottom half of the boot, you're going to see lots of teeny tiny different provinces. And all of these people are essentially just going to be fighting for supremacy and survival. So the early Normans actually start arriving to Italy as mercenaries. And essentially, they get paid to resolve disputes between the local families. Among these early Normans, there was one particular family that will really make their stamp in Italy, that we'll talk about briefly in a few moments, and those are the Hotevilles. Now, the Hotevilles themselves were actually fleeing a political upheaval in the area of Normandy, and they were seeking a new home. Consider that this part of the Norman conquest of southern Italy is actually within, or at least when it begins, is about 30 years prior to the Norman conquest of England by William the Conqueror. And we know during this time period, the Duchy of Normandy is just going through some rough patches. So that's the general background. Well, the overall disputes and fragmentation of the already locals uh, allows the Normans to kind of establish themselves anew and in the area by 1030. And they are going to start in Aversa. And if you're looking very close into the map, you're going to see that the area of Naples is the one that's completely colored in in black. And then right above it, a teeny tiny fraction is Aversa itself. Well, Aversa is going to be where Reinulf 
we're going to be settling his uh, base of power. He's going to become Count of Aversa and he's going to become one of the most powerful players in this area. And as a result, well, the Normans are going to get confident and they're going to start launching a lot of further incursions into different parts of Italy. And this is going to carry on all the way until the 1040s. As a result, I'm sure you'll realize this will start causing quite a lot of tension with the locals to the point that the Pope is going to start perceiving the Normans as freebooters as he's going to try to stop them since he's actually receiving quite a lot of complaints. Unfortunately for him, the Normans are actually going to capture the Pope in the Battle of Civitate sul Fortore in 1053. And as a miracle from this development, the Pope decides that the Normans are actually perfectly cool and decides to ratify their lands in the area. So, you know, things that we learned from the Middle Ages, if you want something suddenly resolved, just capture the Pope. It works every time. But you get the general idea. This is how the Normans managed to establish their supremacy, thanks to their military prowess. Very soon after this, notable Normans will start taking over different parts of the country. Most notably, we're going to have Robert Giscard in 1059 taking over the area of Apulia. And then a generation later, Roger de Hauteville from the original Hauteville's that come into Normandy uh, about 30 years previously, will march into Sicily in 1063. And Sicily is actually going to become a particularly prosperous area for the Normans which will furthermore allow them to launch campaigns to the Holy Land. And this is essentially the base from where the Normans will develop their operations during the Crusades and the main reason why eventually they're able to take over Antioch. So as you can see, this general context is the basis for a mini empire that they're going to have here in the Mediterranean. And all of this kind of comes across to be due to the fact of Norman opportunism and, and their ability to use kind of, you know, take, take as much as they can whenever they can. But that's a bit of a reductionism. There is actually so much more to why the Normans are so successful in Italy and how they're going to ensure their ongoing success. Because very soon they are going to realize, unlike people who were previously trying to rule these lands, that, like I mentioned previously, there is a lot of mixed cultures in this area. And these mixed cultures need to be united somehow. And we see how these people start working together in art. Well, now we're going to dive into architecture. And I'm just going to give you a general basis of architecture first, and then we're going to be looking at specific examples. So, of course, there were some standard practices across the board. We know that the Normans were stonemasons. This is a general tradition that they had already carried uh, back home. And using stone was key for the majority of their constructions. But as they settle into a new area, they also find new resources. And as a result, we start seeing how the use of new materials becomes part of their general bag of tricks. One of the very clear things we're going to start seeing them doing in southern Italy is going to be the use of um, brick and mortar for the construction of vaults uh, as well as rubble for creating very thick walls. And with this, they're also going to start working with new textures and polychrome effects. You know, all of these different materials have different colors and it's going to really become a, a world of variety. The other thing that we see the Normans starting to do at this moment in time is using a different variety of, of arches and openings into buildings, um, depending on what their purpose is. For small openings and windows, we're going to see the typical round Norman arch, what we call Romanesque, traditionally speaking in Europe at this moment in time, which is similar to what we see in constructions of the same kind in France and England, for example. But we also start seeing some uh, more pointed arches, almost triangular but with rounded edges and this is something that they actually borrow from the Muslims and mostly they are used for large building openings such as doorways but as you can see here in this interlaced pattern in the facade of Santa Maria la Nuova in Monreale it's also used for decoration so you know it's not um, a one-size-fits-all kind of description of, of the criteria it's a general set of guidelines like I said. Overall we're gonna see how they're really gonna push over for the use of regional motifs for decoration. And this actually means that different regions of Italy are gonna be able to keep their own style and their uniqueness, which is actually gonna favor the uh, production of local workshops and local artists. 
And overall, this is really going to give us um, yet individualistic, but uh, joined together sense of style across their little empire here, which is very important and fundamental for the idea of identity, integrity and inclusion. Well, now that we have a general background as to how architecture develops in the southern Norman world, let's have a look at castles, because castles are really the stereotypical Norman thing. Throughout the Norman world, castles are the symbol of the family identity, they're an item of prestige, and of course, of visual domination of any kind of landscape. We do have the very strange notion that in the Middle Ages, every single battle that happens is an open field battle where people are dying left, right and center. But let me tell you that that's actually not the case. Pitch battles are actually very limited because everybody was very aware that, you know, a sword could just stab you and that could be the end of it. They are dangerous and most battles in terms of open battles are often resolved through exchange of hostages or even dueling and things like that. However, siege warfare is very important in exchange. And as a result, castles are going to be very crucial as part of these military campaigns, but not just as military campaigns. They're also going to become um, administrative buildings. Now, once we get into this area of the world, we see that the Normans break away from their traditional Motan Bailey, which I will show in a moment and they start developing new things. And this is from the influence of the different cultures that they're seeing in the area. The top castle that you see here is the castle of La Ciza, and we can see testing here the Islamic influence alongside with other Sicilian castles. What they essentially did here was recycle what elegant Muslim castles were to them, um, and instead they make them into court palaces um, with a much more refined kind of feeling. The castle of La Cisa is essentially a three-story building, and pretty much it was perceived to be a country residence for retirement and contemplation, which is something that a lot of Muslim and Islamic cultures of the Middle Ages and actually of this day and age promoted within the idea of nobility and the aristocracy, but that ne not necessarily was shared by many other cultures in Europe. So as you can see, the Normans are seeing, not, it's not just a matter of buying into the art and architecture, it's buying into the idea of the lifestyle. And often lifestyle and architecture and art go together. So we see how they try to merge this so that it fits their own purposes. Then we have more traditional castles, like what you have here at the bottom, which is the Melfi Castle. Now, Melfi Castle is um, super important because the strategic gateway to Apulia, which is the seat of power of Robert Giscard. And it really shows how important castle warfare was, as well as the extent of skill um, that was used to make things like this, because it's not really changed all that much throughout time. It's been able to be preserved in a pretty good state. Now, the majority of what you see here is all limestone and brick. So again, it's a combination of different techniques. And once again, the one thing you can see that the Normans were particularly good at doing, and anyone with a high strategic, um, I guess, value would have been able to appreciate, they are using the very landscape around them to locate the castle in a place where it's elevated, not just in terms of composition, but um, the, the visual domination once you enter the area of Melfi is very, very obvious. It's completely taking over the whole landscape. Well, now, why are these so strange or not necessarily strange, but uncommon? Because, well, the traditional Norman castle looks a little bit like this. This is what we call a Motan Bailey. And we see this a lot both in Normandy and in England. Um, as a general idea, the Motan Bailey goes like this. You create a mot, and the mot is either recycling some kind of elevation in the terrain, like for example, a hill or a mountain, or it's done from earthworks. So they dig the area around it and they create this elevation to put at the top a keep, sometimes, often, if they had the materials for it. It would be either of wood or if they were really lucky, it would be out of stone, which is, like I said, the preferred uh, material to build. And then at the bottom, you would have this large area, which is more like the encampment, the military encampment, which is the bailey. And this is where we have a lot of the other 
logistic buildings that are important in a castle, but that we often don't think about, like the barracks, stables, etc., etc. That is how this was supposed to work. As you can see, this would also be often protected by some kind of palisade. And this is how normally the majority of um, Norman castles were built. So what we've seen in the area of, of Sicily and, and Italy is rather different from that perspective. And it's actually going to create, again, the blueprint for the kind of castles that they're going to build in the Holy Land. Well, now that we understand a bit more the importance of these castles and how things have changed, let's have a look at their other big architectural selling point, which is churches. There are many, many, many different examples of churches across the Southern Norman world. They all have different peculiarities and it's really just a huge melting pot of isolated buildings often or very specific regions. Like a lot of the time I cannot say, oh, this is typical Southern Norman because it may be typical Southern Norman of just Aversa or Apulia. So you really need to think that I'm really just giving you a handful of examples here, like the sky is the limit. Some of these buildings are pretty much down to individual peculiarities. But as a result, what we see is that these churches in southern Italy and Sicily are very, very flavorful. Well, we do see some patterns, though, and I think it's important to appreciate some of those patterns. So let's try and, and break them down. Well, in the areas of Valdemore and Calabria, and we see some other examples as well in Palermo, we know that uh, there is a general popularity of dome churches, like the one that you see here from San Giovanni de Gliamiretti. Eremeti, sorry. Um, these churches are essentially Orthodox basilicas that have been repurposed from areas where we have a high increase of, of Greek population, and they've just been transformed into Norman churches, therefore following Catholic doctrine at the time instead of Orthodox doctrine. The majority of them follow the following layout. Uh, a typical example of these dome churches is that they have a T form instead of a cross form. They have three apses and then five domes on the, on the top, exactly like what you're seeing here. So as you can see, they're appreciating that there is already a Greek population. They are appreciating that they are Christians just of a different kind and it's just PR. They are just using what is already there to mingle with the population. It's syncretism and synergy for sure. Then we have some strange things that happen in the Norman world down south um, which kind of give us a little bit of insight on how the development of this mini empire was sort of happening and wasn't always all that consistent. Now what you see here at the bottom are the ruins in, in Venosa of the Abatria de la Santissima Trinita. Now, I say ruins, but the reality of events is that this was never finished. Like, this is not a building that was complete and now is in the state of repair. It just simply was never completed. And yet the, the layout suggests that these would have been one of the very few churches that we know them to develop in the area that would have actually followed the proper French tradition of an ambulatory and radiating chapels. And if you have keen eyes and you know your general layouts of, of churches pretty well, um, you will see that what we have here, this, this patch of green, is just the general central corridor that normally is at the top of a, of a cross uh, shaped church. And every single archway that you see here would be those radiating chapels that we are referring to. Why do they not finish the church? Well, we're not entirely sure, to be honest. Um, there are a few theories. One of the theories is that, well, perhaps they realize that trying to impose the norms from back home is not really going to get them very far, given the very diverse population. So they abandon the project. But at the same time, we also see evidence that during this time period is also once they also reach um, Sicily and we think that perhaps as soon as Sicily becomes part of their territory, they perceive that it's more important to um, create foundations there and invest in, uh, it, in Sicily instead of in areas like Venosa. So perhaps it's just generally a, a shift of funding and political strategy, or it could be both, but we are not entirely sure. Again, it's, it's one of the many theories. Well, 
I think it's important though that we appreciate what the, the difference is in terms of what the Normans were used to, uh, to sort of uh, compare to, to the area of southern uh, Italy and, and Sicily. Well, this is a very typical Norman uh, church, is the Abbey of, of San Etienne in Caen. Um, and although a little bit later than perhaps some of the ones that I've been mentioning so far, it, it, this is what a classic uh, Norman church looks like. It's very imposing, it's quite chunky, it's intimidating, it has beautiful round arches, everything is symmetrical, and it really makes use of space in ways that support Norman Catholic liturgy. You see the towers in this particular case. Not all Norman uh, churches have towers of this kind. Consider that you know we're going to see some churches that get uh, remodelations later on in the Middle Ages, whether it's in Gothic times or a bit later on in the Renaissance and, and the Baroque. But you understand the general feeling is not what you've seen in the slide prior, right? Well, that is the same case for what you're about to see, although perhaps some of them have a few more points in common. Well, these are two other examples of churches that we see quite often um, throughout the Southern Norman world. Um, and we know that, for example, using the, the photo at, at the bottom, which is of Trani Cathedral, we know that a lot of churches in Apulia uh, had a tendency of having an apse that directly projected from the transept, um, which is what you see kind of here. There is, again, no proper ambulatory. It's just, boom, suddenly, from, from the block that is the church, the, the apse just materializes itself into the shape that you see here, which otherwise would be the, the front end of the church in terms of the cross shape with the um, ambulatory and radiating chapels. The other thing that we see here, both in Trani and in the case up uh, in Cefalu, are these towers. Now, I appreciate these towers perhaps look similar to what you've seen a moment ago in Com, but if you're paying close attention, you will realize there are some slight differences in terms of the details and the feel. And that's because these uh, towers actually borrow a lot from the idea of the um, minaret that is used in Muslim liturgy, which is the tower through which they do their call for prayers. Again, consider that the area of Apulia, and particularly the area of Sicily, is going to have a lot of Islamic influence, and a lot of these structures already existed. So, you know, if the system works, why change it? More importantly, if the system is similar to what you're already familiar with, why not just use it to bring everybody under the same umbrella? Well, now that you've seen some of these examples from the point of view of architecture, let's look at some specific bits from uh, other kinds of art. We're going to start with mosaics because I think the mosaics have a very, very clear Byzantine or, or Greek influence, whichever way you want to call it, in Norman art. And it's quite obvious <laughs> that, you know, what you're seeing here on the left in Santa Maria the La Miraglio or, or La Martorana is something that you would perhaps expect to see in, a, in an Orthodox church, particularly closer to the, to the Middle East or even in Constantinople itself. And this kind of adds another layer. If you consider that, like I've told you, the remnants of uh, Byzantium are indeed the remnants of the old Roman Empire. Now, any kind of European power, pretty much since the development of Rome, all the way to early Renaissance and probably even beyond that, has always tried to find connections to Rome for the sake of legitimacy and for the sake of displaying their power. In some ways, we could consider that by adopting this kind of uh, artistic depictions, the Normans are looking for that same kind of legitimacy, not necessarily from Byzantium, but from what Byzantium represents, which is the legacy of the Roman world and any military leader and, and political leader at the time would have known that if you can equiparate yourself to Rome or at least suggest that you have those ties, immediately everyone else in the world is going to see you as either legitimate or as a threat, which in the case of the Normans, it was good either way. Now, 
these uh, mosaics are obviously great in comparison to some of the classical ways in which Norman a church or, or even Norman secular artists have been able to express themselves because, well, there is a great advantage to, fres um, to mosaics against frescoes. You know, one of the biggest problems we have with frescoes, particularly in some of the places where the Normans are used to habitating, like England or France, is that, well, some parts of those countries have quite nasty weather and humidity is not the friend of paint. So they don't have a tendency to be very well preserved and, and color fades. However, um, in a mosaic, well, you, you quite literally kind of need to chuck uh, something at the tiles to break them, to damage them. Uh, the erosion happens, but it takes so much more to actually, you know, be able to take away color that it has a greater state of preservation. In general, mosaics come across as much more elegant and they are great for both geometric depictions as well as human shape compositions. Because if you think about it, once you are painting on something that is plaster, like if we were doing a, a fresco, paint is already there. You cannot really amend it. You can like paint over it, you can reshape it, but that's it. In a mosaic, up until the moment it sets, up until the moment you apply the, the kind of lacquer or, or glue, the, you know, the, the actual thing that's going to keep it all in, in together, you can still move things around. So it allows you to rectify things, it allows you to be a bit more accurate and have better defined compositions. And that's what you can see here on the left, but also here at the bottom right, which is the floor uh, mosaic. The one on the left is a, is a wall mosaic, the floor mosaic of um, Otranto Cathedral. Now, this is, uh, again, an, an interesting way into seeing how the, the impact of the Normans develops down here. It very much reflects the mix of what they've learned in southern Italy and that perhaps belongs more to the eastern uh, world with more western traditions. And what we see here is the reproduction of scenes of the Bible on the pavement, uh, which was actually commissioned and asked for by Monk Pantaleone. Sometimes we are lucky enough to, to know some of these names. Um, and you're probably wondering why do that? Well, if you've ever gone to church, you may know that there is a specific moment in time, several, but one specifically, in which normally after communion, you're supposed to looking down, go and reflect in the very place where you've been staying, often while still looking down and often while kneeling. By putting these depictions on the floor, it's not just a way of beautifying the space in which your ceremonies are taking place on, which of course is important. That's the, the entire point of decorative arts. But this is also a way of educating people. Remember that back then, most people attending church were majorly illiterate. And not just that, consider once again the huge mix of people that we have in here. There is a general mix of languages, although Latin would have still been the primordial language used in mass. It didn't necessarily mean everybody spoke Latin perfectly. It didn't mean anybody knew what was happening. And we needed to find ways of getting some of those other potential cultures to buy into what the Normans were selling by creating these very specific aspects of the Bible on the pavement. It reinforced the liturgy and it reinforced the knowledge. You knew what you were seeing as you were walking down the aisle back to your seat or in and out of the cathedral and you were learning. So again, we see how this monastic tradition develops and not just the artistic agenda, but the political, social and cultural agenda as well as religious of the Normans in Southern Italy. Well, like I said, mosaics become very popular, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop having frescoes, by the way. Um, I didn't put it on the slide, but this is the uh, fresco from San Angelo de Formis in Capua. Interestingly, though, um, this medium, which is much more traditional in their native lands, um, often appears in places where we see a general, more traditional Norman approach to the way things are run. And this is very much the case of, of the example here in Capua. Uh, we do have a theory that the frescoes of, of this church were actually commissioned by Abbot Desiderius. And the reason why Abbot Desiderius decided to do that was to establish the religious dominance over the area. Now, 
I've been telling you that the Normans did their best to try and mingle with the different peoples and create a society that was multicultural and, you know, beneficial for everybody. But I would be lying through my teeth if I didn't, uh, of course, acknowledge and accept the fact that they were still conquerors and dominance was something that had to happen. So in areas where things could be potentially tricky, either because there are rebellions or because power is new or because the mix of people is a bit two out there, reminding the locals of who are the new overlords through traditional means such as their traditional uh, architecture and art is another way of establishing dominance and legitimacy. So just because, you know, they were trying to run things smoothly, it doesn't mean that there were some hiccups and it doesn't mean that, of course, at the end of the day, this is a, a a new conquest or an invasion of a new land, whatever you want to call it, because in some ways it's both. Um, sometimes things are going to be a bit more forceful than others. So, you know, not everything was entirely peaceful. We know that there were some sociological problems in, in different parts and some rebellions. And of course, uh, the fact that a church here following traditional Norman Catholic doctrine may have to compete with, for example, Greek population or Muslim population is, of course, going to cause some problems. This is just a way of reinstating what should be obvious. Who is in charge? Well, not everything that has to do with the beauty of art of the Norman world has to do with what they put on their walls or they put on their floors. And I love it because everything that is on this slide, I, I didn't do it on purpose, but everything here actually starts with M. And it is clear influence of, uh, again, other art styles or the local variations. What you see here on the left is another very clear Muslim influence, which is the famous Mukarnas or what we call in English the honeycomb ceiling. Now, this is particularly prominent in the Capella Palatina in Palermo, which is actually what you're looking at. Um, and in case you don't know or you've never seen this before, uh, it Essentially, the idea is kind of making this look as if it's almost like stalactites covered in paint. Um, these are sometimes made out of wood uh, or plaster, and sometimes they are just painted or carved into them. It, it can have a variation of both. And in this particular case, we know that it was painted by local artists who were of Muslim inheritance around 1140, because there are records that that is how this was actually commissioned. So it's a bit weird, perhaps, that in a very Catholic church like the Capella Palatina, you find elements like this. But also in this very same church, you will find images of a Christo Pantro Pantocrator, which is very similar to the icons of the Orthodox Church. So it really proves that these were melting pots and local artists were valued because they were bringing richness, elegance, and elements that enhance the general appearance of what the Normans were bringing to the table. And that's something that we see as well on the example on the, on the right. Now, these are the very beautiful doors of um, the uh, Cathedral in Trani. We know that um, metalwork is particularly noteworthy throughout Norman times, specifically in Southern Italy. And here, this beautiful doorway that you see um, is once again the uh, work of a very important local artist who flourishes under the commission of, of Norman art, who is Barisano de Trani. And the work that you see here in the doorways, again representing uh, biblical uh, scenes, is incorporated into yet other pieces of art that demonstrate the intermingling and mixing of all of these different variants of art and cultures. We see this opening that I mentioned earlier, how this almost triangular or at least pointed arch of Muslim influence is here once again, mixed with the different layers of decoration that goes around the arch, some of which we can identify with patterns that we see in um, Normandy or England, like the, for example, the, the checker pattern or the uh, dented pattern with the little triangles. So it's really a combination of different elements, but in a way that they mix together harmoniously. It's not just thrown in together at random. There is actually a lot of coherent sense to it all, which is what makes the development of 
Southern Italian art during the time of the Normans incredibly magical, special, and very unique. And again, all of this is done by evaluating and appreciating what the locals already have, putting it at the disposal of the new powers, and embracing those cultures for good or, or bad in some cases. So, what is the legacy that the Normans leave us behind? Well, I think we probably all have now more <laughs> questions than answers, but that's often the, the case with history. Um, I think a lot of what we've seen promotes the general thought that there is a lot of commentary here to do with identity and culture. Um, I think it would be quite easy to see or think that the Normans perhaps were trying to rebrand themselves once they arrived to Southern Italy into something else. And maybe I don't think it's far-fetched to think that they were actually rebranding themselves as Byzantine emperors or Roman emperors in, in that sense. I think it's very easy to perceive the, um, the Norman conquest of Italy as a kind of newfound land, a place where people could make a difference and take new chances, like what we referred earlier with the Hauteville and how a few generations later, Roger would develop the, uh, the area of Sicily. But it's interesting though, because they didn't just grab all the local influences and the things that they had in there and they normanize them. They blend them together in a way that they are still recognizable as individual features, not just by the locals, but even by us nowadays, but also in a way that they are harmonious regardless of their background. So what is this? Is this new Romanesque? Because um, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure we can call it that. I'm not even entirely sure it's actually Romanesque. It's definitely a thing of its own and often very down to the specific area that you're in. And it's actually got many scholars proposing or even thinking that if not the origin, because normally we consider that the origin of Gothic is in, in France or in some regions of Germany, depending on where you're looking at things, perhaps this is at least the influence or the inception point from where some of those features will be taken. Because if you're looking at some of the features here, when you tell me that the, uh, the bridge that you have down here, the Ponte de la Miraglio, doesn't look a bit like Gothic or Proto-Gothic, or what about the top of that rose window in, in Troya Cathedral? Are these things the same or is it just coincidental? It's, whichever the case you see it, it's definitely special and unique. And that's, that's what matters, that's what makes this so um, worthy of its own contemplation and admiration. And overall, I think it is fair to say that the Normans do change their foreign identities while they are developing themselves in Southern Italy. And they do this while preserving the local diversity with the hope of creating a stronger and more united society. Whether or not this was always entirely successful, well, that's a different matter. But definitely in art, we see that they were able to merge these things together and make something even more divine than what they were already creating in other parts of the world. And that is all for today. So thank you so much for listening to the lecture. Like I said, check out the links at the bottom of the video for uh, supporting us on Buy Me A Coffee and uh, on PayPal. And we'll be back with a few more of these lectures and virtual talks as the uh, cold season develops. We have a lot of new things coming on this autumn and winter. So don't miss them. And remember to subscribe. We'll see you soon.